much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to contribute to the second reading in the Media Bill today. This comes at an absolutely crucial time for our creative industries and broadcasters. If I think about the uh, fact that the 10-year licences, uh, uh, several broadcasters are already applying for that, and it's important that we have settled approach in how those licences can be granted. I should uh, refer um, the, uh, the House to my transparency register as a minister and also my uh, interests that I've declared in the uh, Members' Register. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm sure actually uh, it's uh, the other Deputy Speaker who was in the chair earlier, um, the Honourable Mem Right Honourable Member for Thunet North, who was actually Director of Children's TV for the BBC in the 70s. And uh, there have been a number of uh, uh, already contributions made. For what it's worth, mine were Paddington, Pipkins, Mr Ben, and as has often been said by the person who created Mr Ben, one of the things that had to be attractive was that uh, children's TV had to be uh, good for uh, uh, older children, but also the adults as well, who'd often sit alongside the children uh, watching it. So it's part many a career, including members of uh, uh, the other house, but also uh, are some of the greatest broadcasters that we have today. Madam Speaker, the media bill reflects the change in technology that uh, how people consume uh, broadcasting in a variety of ways. And while a lot more is on the go or on demand, and I regret that there are fewer community moments, uh, water cooler moments, as uh, perhaps they were, used to be called, they still do play that vital role of shaping the conversation, the fun, the joy that people have in watching that, as well as exposing, in many ways, some of the interesting challenges that we face. But I think this bro broader landscape and market, and I welcome the, um, the, what we have, the global online platforms, because it really has helped the viewer, it's helped the creative industries. It's also come with risk for our public service broadcasters, particularly our commercial public service broadcasters, who have responsibilities that those other organisations simply do not have. And it's important that it's be viable and sustainable, that we recognise the context in which uh, they land. I think there's also, um, I want to recognise as well, there's already been at least one call from the Shadow Secretary of State, I think, for the use of Henry VIII powers. And that is because we need to be flexible. Re the last time we had this uh, uh, legislation was in 2003. By the time this bill goes through, and I hope it will go through at pace, because it really matters to our broadcasters and the industry that it does, um, that we need to have that flexibility built in. And just as my honourable friend, the member for uh, Folkestone and Hive mentioned, you know, there are certain issues, I think, where Channel 4 would have liked this to have gone slightly further in some of the flexibility. So let's build that flexibility in now and not see those Henry VIII powers as being something bad, but actually to what they are used for. And I must admit, in my role as a minister, one of the most flexible ones was the 1990 Environmental Protection Act. And it was by having uh, Henry VIII powers that we were able to keep pace with the challenges that was faced. And I think that should be, we should welcome uh, the opportunity for some of those powers to be added to this bill. I also uh, um, thank the, the members of both houses who served in the pre legislative scrutiny. It made it a stronger bill, but I think it was also important that the government has largely listened. And I think that shows a maturity and why I believe this bill will be uh, a success. What I would say is that I join, uh, echo the comments that have already been made by members in this debate, of thinking to clauses 362AM and 362AO, uh, the balance of uh, making sure we use the word significant, not just appropriate, because we need to give clarity and a firm message to Ofcom. At the end of the day, Ofcom is an independent regulator. They don't represent people uh, right across the country. And it's important that Parliament can have a voice in pushing that and promoting that. And that's why, as a particular, uh, as the Select Committee referred to in their report, um, that uh, there was a particular one where negative SIs are going to be used by the government. And I would just ask the government just to slightly think again, having experienced a variety of legislation, the role for negative SIs is very well established and it represents about 80% of legislation that we do and that's to try and keep updating some minor points. But I think those sorts of elements, just leaving it to Ofcom or indeed uh, having to take these things to court um, isn't necessary when actually Parliament can assert that role. Now, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in particular I'm really pleased about the change in government policy that happened and has led in particular to the uh, part of the bill regarding Channel 4. Uh, people know it was under a Conservative government, uh, Margaret Thatcher in 1982, that created Channel 4 as a way to try and contest having a, 
public sector broadcaster, still state-owned, uh, but to be generating all its revenue uh, privately rather than through the licence fee. And what a job it has done, including on the same day, of course, the creation of S4C. Now, I very much welcome the special status that Channel 4 will continue to have, but also the new powers, and that's the freedom and flexibility to produce. And I do welcome the commitment still made to the independent sector, and I know that Channel 4 will not uh, suddenly rush uh, to bring everything in-house. Far from it. Why would they when they've been so successful in the way they've done? But in particular, I want to sp pay tribute to the exceptional Chief Executive, Alex Mahon, who has been a real champion for Channel 4, for the creative industries, and long may she flourish. In terms of um, um, the excellent ITV as well, uh, I would suggest that uh, they really do need this equal playing field and this opportunity, uh, particularly thinking of the global platform issue. It's the extra um, burdens, as it were, that are put on through being a public service broadcaster are important for the diversity of TV that we <coughs> enjoy. Uh, and I know that uh, ITV continues to go from strength to strength, just like Channel 4 has made transformations in its filming and portrayal of the Paralympics in 2012, which has now been recognised around the world by the Paralympics movement as a real game changer. And just the same, ITV, with its brave coverage of a variety of news, uh, perhaps they're spending a lot more money by going to some of the most challenging parts of the world, as well as, of course, there are other broadcasters like Sky and similar who have done similar. Uh, but I think uh, that they need uh, to be make sure that the when Ofcom have these powers that we give to them, that we give strong message about that Ofcom have a robust application and enforcement of prominence for PSBs on global online platforms on terms that, frankly, enable PSBs to thrive and deliver their remits. In terms of, uh, there's been much said about local radio. Uh, I think uh, I've seen an, a significant number of local radios being created in uh, Suffolk Coastal, recognising actually the changes that BBC Suffolk undertake to reduce the amount of very local content, uh, which while I regret, uh, it has actually opened up the opportunity for many more uh, broadcasters, and I welcome the, uh, what will happen in the bill to make it easier uh, for those local radio stations to be able to uh, broadcast and thrive. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I turn to uh, Part 7 of the Bill in particular in regards to um, the Leveson Inquiry. And dare I say it to Honourable Members, right and right Honourable Members, there is a lesson for us that quite a knee-jerk reaction to an inquiry that was very prominent in the public domain is not necessarily the best way to generate new legislation. Um, I get it, look, as a, uh, I can see uh, why people were so upset at the time and continue to be when it seems that it feels that the media have freedom to trash people's lives and reputations. But it was not the right knee-jerk reaction to do and it was good that we never commenced uh, Section 40 but that we are repealing it. What I would say though is that I would be very concerned if this led to a rush of newspapers uh, suddenly departing from um, the uh, process that is in place under RIPSO. Uh, I know that there are some other broadcasters, uh, sorry, other newspapers who have chosen not to use it, IPSO or Impress, uh, but we should not be actively encouraging that through this bill. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, good bill. Um, I hope that the government will work at pace and that the House will let it do so because it's really important for the commercial viability and sustainability of the PSBs that we enjoy. Not, none of them have the benefit of the, uh, of the license fee where the BBC does not need particularly to work to generate that income. And I should say I worked there for um, about six to nine months before becoming a Member of Parliament. Uh, they have a very special place in the UK's uh, kind of life. Uh, but it's important that we have that wide range of PSBs and this media bill will help that be sustainable for the future.